in, in politics. Um, and I think the public is confused. The public loves science, but they get they have the slightest idea what scientists do. I mean, they don't, for example, I remember the first week that Science Friday was on, we, it was a week when uh, news was talking about the giant meteor that hit and wiped out the dinosaurs. That's how long ago that we've been on the air. <laughs> and we were talking about whether that was true and how that happened, and I had the scientist there who had made the discovery, and uh, a scientist called up on the phone, and he said to the scientist sitting next, he says, I finally got you to sit still and answer my question. You've been ducking me on the phone all this time. And he was a very, he was a famous biologist who said, I have an alternate theory that's just as good as yours, and why don't you answer the phone and tell, talk to me about it? And we, they got into it a little bit. And the first, bit, the first letter that poured in from a listener was from Barbara in New Jersey, and she said, I'm shocked. Scientists argue with each other. <laughs> Scientists disagree. It doesn't science know this? You know, most people think science is this giant book that sits on your table, and you open it up, and there's a fact about this, and you open it up, and there's a fact about this, and they don't, they don't understand the process that science is a process, and that it, what we know about science, what science tells us in that process of finding out about nature, is changing all the time. And they, they have trouble, the public has trouble dealing with risk and dealing with stuff that's in a gray area. They want, you know, they, they've been attuned to the food fight, you know, the, the extremes on both ends, and they have trouble with that. Um, but so far I've talked about a lot of really sort of bad news. The good news is, uh, that, is that people, as I say, love to talk about science. These, I'm sure these students here, they love to talk about science. They talk about it whenever they can. Uh, the Big Bang Theory. You ever seen the Big Bang Theory on television? Yes. It's about a bunch of physics geeks, right? It is the most popular entertainment show on CBS. In fact, I'm Science Friday, he was on the Big Bang a few years ago, interviewing Sheldon. They, they wanted to find a show. And Sheldon could be on a radio show, and they all said, hey, let's get him on Science Friday. So they played a trick on Sheldon while he was being interviewed by me on, on, on the Big Bang Theory. And that episode, you know, we used to run back to back with two and a half men, same producers. That was the first time ever that that episode outscored the ratings. <laughs> two and a half men. We were at uh, our next question is from Fred Byers at table number eleven. If you were stranded on a desert island, would you rather be with a scientist or a philosopher? My <laughs> <laughs> choices. So, I think a scientist will help you better find food. You need an engineer. Uh, more than a scientist. The people confuse scientists and engineers are really, are really different. But I, I, I go with the engineer. I need Bill Nye, the science guy. Either. Next question is from table number one. Trent, is the privatization of space travel a good idea for advancing space exploration? I think it's a great idea. You know, um, the aviation industry, if we follow the model that, uh, that NASA was had to be involved in uh, the aviation industry following the Wright brothers, we would have never had an aviation industry. The government would have run that. We now have, we now have some really good competition going on, and uh, it's going to be very exciting to see. There are even people talking, private people talking about going to Mars. Um, a one-way trip. You know that, the scientists have predicted that a one -way, that Mars will be a one-way trip, and last week it was announced that 70,000 people have signed up for that one -way trip. Last question is from one of our science stars. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Jessica at table number 12. What is your greatest fear and or hope for our planet in the next five to ten years? Uh, well, my greatest fear is that global warming will run away. And it will get out of hand, and, and um, there will become a tipping point where the oceans, and you study here, you can see it, you study the oceans of a great marine center. And if the oceans get to a point where they can't absorb all the carbon dioxide, the oceans are turning acidic. And when they turn acidic, the coral life, most of the coral life, it, it's been predicted that by 2050, it'll be gone from the oceans. And we depend on all our food and all our weather and everything else from the ocean. And I'm fearful that uh, if the oceans get
get to that point where they turn into something that we, we don't recognize for food or for weather or for hurricanes or whatever, that, that's, a, that's a big fear of, of my own. Um, I'm hopeful that maybe uh, enough people will hear this sort of thing, you know, and, and maybe maybe take action and think about uh, getting together. I, you know, maybe there, a, lot, a lot of people like to think there's a quick technology fix or something. I don't see one happening. I'm also I'm hopeful that with solar power, which I think is really making leaps and bounds, may uh, take over as one of the main uh, sources of energy. I know you, you talk about nuclear here in, in town, um, but it takes so long to do. And, you know, I, I think that uh, solar could probably out, outrun it. Next question is from Jenna at table number 21. Would you rather be able to fly or be invisible. It's <laughs> a creative question. I've never been asked. I actually learned how to fly an airplane as a pilot. As a private pilot for a little bit. Um, or be invisible. I'd rather be invisible. Right? You'd rather be invisible? Yeah. I don't know why. I'd be, I mean, sort of neat. 